Our final speaker of the day is a Sclerolens expert who always has a smile on his face, Dr. John Gillis. He is the director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division of the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute and the CLEI Center for Keratoconus in Teaneck, New Jersey. He's got a pretty robust lecture today, so um, I'm not gonna read all his affiliations, but he's a fellow board member, chair of multiple uh, societies and organizations, and he is dedicated to specialty contact lenses and the management of keratoconus, corneal disease, ocular surface disease, and post-surgical corneal conditions. So please welcome Dr. John Gellis. There we go. Okay, now we're good. Now we're good. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Rob. So uh, I guess today, let's see here, should be sharing my screen now. Is this right? Yep. There we go. Now we're good. <laughs> so today we're going to talk a little bit about advanced optics of scleral lenses and kind of what you can do beyond 2020. So uh, I got some acknowledgments that I got to make. Uh, Dr. Becky Sue is my current cornea and contact lens fellow. Uh, she is absolutely amazing, has really helped to contribute to the vast majority of what you're going to see today, and uh, has made many of the presentations that I'll actually be uh, presenting on here. Uh, so just, in a, and we work in a great center with an amazing team, Dr. Peter Hirsch, Dr. David Chu, and Dr. Stephen Greenstein. Uh, without them, this uh, really wouldn't be possible. Also, I have to thank you know, the Scleral Lens Society, Rob, for uh, you know having me on uh, today, and uh, Stephanie Wu and Wu Yu. So uh, let's let's party. Um, so we first want to think about the eye mostly as just like an optical system, right? We kind of think of the eye as being everything. It's the media, and it's the surfaces. If we treat it like a true optical system. We have the front surface of the cornea, the back surface of the cornea, and both of those have a contribution to the overall dioptric power of the eye. We can think of the anterior of the crystalline lens, posterior of the crystalline lens also have a contribution, but then so do the axial lengths of the eye and the media uh, indices as we go through. The, you know, we compare the cornea to the vitreous to the aqueous, all of these things have different indices and when we look at that, all of it comes together to create the optical system of the eye. So what happens when we add a contact lens in there? Well, it just becomes another lens in the optical system of the eye, right? So what we're doing with contact lenses really today is we're coming up with static solutions to the dynamic problems of the eye, right? We know that generally the axial length and corneal shape isn't really going to change that much uh, you know, from day to day, from minute to minute, those sorts of things. However, we have a dynamic visual system, right? We have eye movement, we blink, our tear film changes from blink to blink, our pupil size is going to change depending on the lighting, our lens is going to change shape based on how far we're, or how much we're going to accommodate. All of these things are, you know, a dynamic, you know, contribute to the dynamic system of the eye. And what we're gonna talk about right now are static solutions to solving the general optical problem of the eye. If we look into the future though, what we're gonna be looking at are things where optics are variable. Optics can change over time. Optics can respond to the environment around us to create dynamic solutions for these dynamic problems, right? But we're not quite there yet. So let's, let's saddle in for some uh, static optics. So first, to kind of understand this lecture, we just really need to understand the concept of what's an aberration, right? So aberration really describes the spreading of light from a perfect point of focus. So if you can see this image right here, what we're looking at is a perfect white point on a black background. If you had an absolutely perfect optical system, you would see exactly that, a perfect point on the black background. None of us sitting here today looking at this image are seeing a perfect point on a black background. We're seeing a little bit of smudging around it, a little bit of blurring, a little bit of spreading of that light, and that is aberration, right? Now, we can define these shapes of the spreading of light in different methods, and we call them various different things based on the pattern. So we have defocus, stigmatism, 
And then we have things like spherical aberration, coma, trefoil, the more kind of complex shapes that these, uh, these point spread functions can spread into, right? So how do we organize this? How do we talk about this? Well, we classify the way that this light spreads in a series of polynomials that we call Zernike polynomials. It's a description, uh, and in this case, a visual description of how that light is spreading and what sort of pattern is being created. Now, there are orders that these are organized in. And the orders change based on how complex the shape is getting. Now, when we look at understanding a individual order within this, right, we're looking at the deviation from a plane of focus, right? So how do we understand wavefront data? When I say, hey, this individual has a micron and a half of coma and it's negative coma, what does that mean? Well, what we're talking about is the deviation from a perfect plane of light. So let's say in the example on the left or on the bottom left, what we're gonna see is this is a perfect model eye. The focus of that eye lines up perfectly with a perfect uh, uh, reference plane. Now let's say that we have this individual here where they have spherical aberration, right? What does spherical aberration mean? Well, it's the pattern in which we have a deviation away from that perfect reference plane. So what we can see is that we're creating a deviation away from that plane and coming back from it. And you can see it's very symmetric in its method. That sort of aberration profile is something that you're going to see on an eye that may have an oblate profile. So think of your post-RKs, your post-corneal, excuse me, corneal refractive surgery like LASIK or PRK or SMILE in the myopic fashion, and you get kind of this spherical aberration effect, right? Now, the other portion of this is, let's say we have coma, something like what we would see in an individual with keratoconus. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's an uneven deviation away from that pattern or from that, excuse me, reference plane. And what we're doing is we're measuring the distance from the reference plane to the abnormal wavefront or the wavefront from the eye, right? So the amount of microns away from this reference plane is what we're talking about when I say 1.5 microns of coma, right? Now I may say it's minus or positive, right? So, so whether negative or positive coma. And that ends up with the deviation as to which direction this is happening. Is it happening as a vertical coma where it's more negative on top or and more positive on the bottom? Or is it happening the opposite direction? We have more negative on the bottom, more positive on the top. The other thing that's very important to recognize about this is if I'm talking about aberrations and I say an individual has 1.5 microns of coma, that means nothing unless I've told you how big the pupil is that we're measuring that coma at. Because we can't compare things that have different pupil sizes unless we normalize to the smaller pupil size. So in this presentation, everything that I'm going to show you has been normalized for a comparison unless I've otherwise stated, OK? Um, and again, a, 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 a you know, simulation of this is coming from a keratoconic cornea. That would be the coma that you're seeing there. So how do we how do we capture wavefront aberrometry? How do we understand these wavefronts? How do we map out the vision of somebody's eye objectively? Well, what we use is a wavefront aberrometer. Aberrometer. So what happens with a wavefront aberrometer is it projects a wavefront of light in a perfect plane into the eye. And it watches how those light rays are reflected back out of the eye. Those light rays, that reflected wavefront, now has all the distortions of the full optical system in it. And that gets reflected back into the device. As it's going into the device, that wavefront hits a micro lens little ray so that we can understand where the deviations of that light are coming from. That micro lens lit array focuses the light in individual points on a sensor. And those individual points are what you see below. 
what we're looking at is displacement of those, uh, those dots from a grid. The more displacement we have, the more aberrations we have, the worse the vision. The other thing that we're looking at is the clarity of those dots, right? How focused or defocused those, uh, those lights are, or excuse me, those spots are. And when we look at this, by those definitions, we can start to understand the vision of an individual objectively. So kind of think of it as like a really, really high tech radioscope, or excuse me, a <laughs> retinoscope, right? With a retinoscope, we're able to see what's the reflection of the light coming back out of the eye. And if we see deviations in the pupil, like what we might see on a patient with keratoconus, we can say, oh, that's abnormal, right? Well, this is doing it objectively and being able to quantify that uh, with you know, the micron measurements that we talked about before. So we can look at this a couple different ways. This is gonna be the raw spot image that we're gonna see, right? So what we can see is on the left here is a normal eye and on the right is a keratoconic eye. In the normal eye, you can see that those spots are generally pretty evenly spaced. They're not perfectly spaced though because the eye isn't perfect. And you can see that generally the spots are about the same size. When we look at the keratoconic eye though, you can see how the spots are various different sizes. Some are more defocused, some are more in focus. There's more coalescence or spreading of those lights uh, or spots in different areas. We use this data to then calculate other different forms. So we can simulate what an individual's point spread function would look like. So again, what that black, uh, or excuse me, what that white dot on the black background is going to look like how much spreading of that light that individual is going to see. So again, on the left is the normal, on the right is the keratoconic, and you can see how much spreading of light the keratoconic sees. We can go ahead and put that into a power map so that we understand the way that the aberration is happening throughout the pupil. Now remember that wavefront aberrometry is only being measured across the pupil. It's not a full corneal metric. So as big as the pupil is, that's how much wavefront data we can collect. If the pupil is really small, we only collect a small amount of wavefront data, right? Another way that we can look at this is we can graph out those individual polynomials. So we can talk about the low order aberrations, we can talk about the higher order aberrations, and we can quantify how much of each is there. So we may say, hey, this individual has a certain amount of horizontal coma or vertical coma or trefoil, all these sorts of aberrations, we can quantify those individual contributions to the total wavefront aberrometry that an individual has. Now, the downside to this is that when using a wavefront aberrometer, we're not able to distinguish what portion of the eye the deviation is coming from. This is a non-specific uh, method of looking at uh, the, the optical system of the eye. Now, what we can do though, and this is very important because I actually heard this earlier today, but topography is not the same as wavefront aberrometry. You can use topography to ray trace a surface. So just like we did in school, right? If we had a surface, we could ray trace off of that and come up with how the light is being focused, right? Off of that single surface, right? A topographer, because it is a reflection off of a corneal surface, it is only measuring that corneal surface. And it's looking at the corneal surface across the entire cornea. So that is not the same thing as looking at the entire contribution of the optical system with all of its components. So when we look at this, they're basically measuring two different aspects of the eye. Of the eye. Aberrometry, wavefront aberrometry will give you the total optical system. Topography will only give you the surface of what you're measuring. So if the surface that you're measuring is the cornea, it can calculate out based on the spacing on those rings, what sort of inferred aberration the cornea might be able to contribute to on that anterior surface. And if you add a contact lens into that, you can also get an idea of what the surface of that contact lens is going to do, right? Because the contact lens is now the thing that the 
light is reflecting off of, those rings are uh, reflecting off of. So does aberrometry from topography equal the same thing as the wavefront aberrometry from a wavefront aberrometer? No, it does not. Wavefront aberrometry gives you real total ocular aberrations and the topographer is only going to give you inferred corneal or contact lens surface aberrations. Now, what about if we wanna know where the location is of the aberrations? We wanna be able to say, hey, is this coming from inside of the eye or is this coming from the cornea itself? Well, if we combined a wavefront aberrometer with a topographer or corneal tomographer, we're able to then differentiate the source, but it all has to be combined in the same device. So what we can see is if we use a traditional topographer, placido ring topographer, we're only able to measure the anterior surface of the cornea. So we could say the anterior surface of the cornea may or may not be responsible for the aberrations that we're seeing on the total wavefront, but we can't say that it's entirely the cornea that is or is not the problem. We can't differentiate that because we can't look at the backside of the cornea. Now, when we use corneal tomography, corneal tomography, like Scheinflug tomography, we're gonna to get the anterior and the posterior cornea. Thus, we can calculate the total contribution of aberrations from those two surfaces and say, okay, we can eliminate the cornea as the cause of this and say that it is truly a dysfunctional intraocular uh, structure. So this is how we can differentiate where the aberrations are coming from. Now, that being said, aberrations are variable and they are dependent on pupil size, but also age, right? The bigger the pupil gets, the more aberrations we get into the eye, the more light coming into the eye because the aperture is now larger, right? We know how pinhole effect works. We get a smaller pinhole to look through, the less scattering of light, the more increased depth of focus. So the larger the pupil, the more aberrations. Additionally, the older the individual, the more aberrations that we see. This work was done by Applegate, Marsac's group, uh, some of the leaders in this research. And what we can see is that there is a, uh, a relationship that happens between aberrations, pupil diameter, and age. It's all graphed here. But it's specifically impactful in those higher order aberrations. So what do I mean when I say high and low order aberrations? So if we look at our Zernike pyramid, it is split into high and low order aberrations. The low order aberrations are the first and second order aberrations. First order is gonna be tilt, and then our second order is gonna be defocused and astigmatism. When we look at defocused and astigmatism, we're going to get our myopia and hyperopia, right? That's what defocus is. And we can correct that with spherical lenses. Our astigmatism is corrected with cylindrical lenses, just all the stuff that we normally do. And those can be uh, quantified like this in a point spread function, but we know that that can be corrected adequately in glasses, but this is the traditional type of optics that we work on with scleral lenses, right? So you can see on the left, a spherical lens. What we're doing here is I just took a placido ring topography over the top so that you can understand the shape of the optics on the front surface of the lens. So you can see a spherical lens on the left, a toric lens on the right. And if we go ahead and change this into a uh, tangential map so that we can get more contour in there, you can see the contour of those uh, optics a little bit better. Now, when we look at lens optics, we know that if we're gonna be doing low order correction, stability is extremely important, right? we need to stabilize the lens on the eye. We can do that with prism on the front surface of the lens. Either we use a prism ballast, like what you see in red, where we are thicker down at the bottom of the lens, or we use double slab off, right? It's thinner on the tops and bottoms and thicker in the, excuse me, <laughs> thicker in the horizontal. Uh, when we look at that though, those lenses, if we're using spherical back surfaces on them, we're relying entirely on the weighting of that lens. And that will allow for some movement in these lenses. The better answer is to use toric haptic stabilization, right? The more we can get a lens to want to lock into place on the eye, 
the better we're going to get optical stabilization for this individual. Now we know how to handle when we have a lens that's stable but rotated, we know that we can adjust for our optics to be in the right position for an individual, right? But if we have poor stabilization, we can't really do that. How do we do that? Just like what we heard earlier today. We have a lens that, you know, we can't incorporate comfortably the amount of cylinder that we want into it. We'll use over spectacles, right? If we can't get good stabilization, that's our, our method of choice, right? Or we can go back and revise the fit to get an adequately fit lens. Now, one of the things that's extremely important though is to see what's happening with the alignment of the lens compared to the line of sight, right? One of the easiest ways to do this at the slit lamp is to tell an individual while you're looking at the light, crank it down to a thin, thin beam, line it up on the toric markers on the lens, and just tell them, look directly at the light. And you can see where the lens is in relationship to the line of sight. You can see on the left here, we have a lens that is way, way inferiorly decentered. Whereas on the right, you can see that this lens is just slightly inferiorly descended. So these sorts of changes are something that we need to be aware of because that's going to become important as we move forward in more complex optics, right? Now, the reason that we talk about haptics in this is because haptics are what's really going to best control the way a lens is going to stay stable on the eye. And we know if we use diagnostic fitting, we can do spherical or toric or even quadrant specific haptics. But if we use the more advanced methods, we can do you know, scan-based lenses where we scan the eye, model a lens, design the lens, and then manufacture it to hold the contour of the eye. And those lenses are really gonna lock in place. Very much in the same vein, we can do the same thing with impression-based lenses. We take an impression of the eye, we 3D scan it, we model it, we design it, we manufacture it, right? And those lenses, again, are gonna kind of lock into place a little bit more because they're taking into account more detail of that ocular surface. Now, if we have a really well-stabilized lens, what can we do with it? Well, we can incorporate prism in this. This is an image from Melanie Forgozo. What you can see here is one of her patients who had horizontal diplopia and the use of a prism optic being put into the lens. This is not prism for stabilization, but prism to solve a diplopia. So when we incorporate prism into a contact lens, I want to just talk about a case first, and this will kind of tell us all the pitfalls and why we can do it in a scleral lens successfully and why we may have uh, issues doing it otherwise. So if we take a look here, this is an individual that we just saw. This is a 56 year old male with a history of a retinal detachment, and he's post uh, pars planar vitrectomy uh, without a scleral buckle. Postoperatively, he has a uh, diplopia, and uh, they, it's presumed to be related to the nerve block, um, but it's a six diopter left hypertropia. And when we look at postoperatively, additionally, he also had cataract formation. Um, so we had a bilateral cataract surgery where they tried to do a little bit of monovision for the individual to one, kind of reduce some of the, uh, uh, or rather to break the fusion a little bit more so that the individual on the eye that's not quite aligned is a little bit more out of focus, hopefully making things a little bit more tolerable for the individual. But when he came into us, his chief complaint was that, you know, he has diplopia, anisometropia, everything is double, my eyes aren't working together, and I get a Coke bottle effect from the right eye and he just wants help, right? He's gotten a bunch of different pairs of uh, prism, uh, prism glasses. Um, and when we look at the, uh, the other options that he's tried, um, he's tried a monovision uh, variation of a soft lens where he's putting even more plus onto the right eye to reduce that binocularity even further. So almost think of it as like blur penalization to that eye. And he feels that that's the best solution for, so far, but he still can't function, especially while he's reading. So when we look at this manifest refraction, you know, they pretty much nailed that mini monovision target that they were going for with the cataract surgery. Um, but this individual, you know, is very uncomfortable with that anisometropia. Um, when we looked at this, 
you know, he's an attorney. We got, <laughs> got a little doubling on this. Hold on. There we go. When we look at this, we go, so what are our plans here? We have several options of what we could do, right? Uh, we have the idea that we could correct his anisometropia to get rid of that magnification effect with a soft lens on the right eye or have him do some corneal refractive surgery there and then put Plano glasses with prism in them over the top. Patient surgery adverse, he doesn't want glasses. Well, what about if we did custom soft lenses? We know that we can get face down prism in custom soft lenses. Well, there become some problems there. Stability of a soft lens, especially with an extra thick, heavy amount of prism in the, uh, in the lens, is going to be poor. The stability is going to be rocking around. That thickness is going to be very apparent to the patient. There's also the cosmesis of having that lower lid kind of protruding forward a little bit uh, with nothing on the right eye to kind of compensate for it. And we also have prism limitations, right? We can only go up so high and we can only give so much of a, uh, of a base down prism for that individual. Now, what about if we go and, ex uh, and use a scleral lens? but we use an impression-based platform. Well, this is the ideal option. We can do them bilaterally. We can split the prism so there's less in each eye, and we can add advanced optics if we want to in the future. So this is what we did. We went ahead and incorporated a two base down prism in the right eye and a two base up in the left eye, and this resolved the patient's symptoms, much, much improved. And you can see the thickness up top here on the left eye, thickness down low on the left eye, or on the right eye, and you can really see it in the OCTs, that change in thickness from top to bottom. So prism can be incorporated in these eyes. It's also been shown in multiple different abstracts that we can use it horizontally and combine horizontal with vertical as well. So this is one of the options for kind of those more, uh, more advanced optical profiles. Now let's start getting into higher order aberrations, right? These are uh, Zernike polynomials kind of in the third order and greater. The ones that we are most concerned with, especially when we're dealing with our irregular corneal patients are the third order aberrations, looking at coma and trefoil, but also the fourth order of spherical aberrations. So when we look at this, these are the sorts of things that we're seeing. It's the, uh, uh, the halo, flare, glare, spread, smear, starburst, those sorts of things that patients are really uh, referring to when they're saying, oh, I'm having these problems uh, with, with the quality of the vision. Higher order aberrations really, really contribute to the quality of vision, right? These are not going to be correctable with glasses. So let's kind of run through this a little bit, right? Let's put it all together. So let's say we had a model eye with perfect optics. Our spot diagram is going to be perfect spacing with perfect clarity of the dots. We're going to have a perfect point spread function and great vision. If we have a normal cornea, we're going to have a little bit of aberration there. You can see that point spread function got a little bit bigger, and our vision is going to be pretty darn good. What about if we add severe keratoconus and we put even uh, we we put correction into this? Right, this individual has terrible terrible optics. You can see their point spread function is all over the place. They have tons of higher order aberration, even if we're correcting them with glasses, right? And we can see all of that visual effect here in the simulation. Now, if we add glasses to this, we can make the, uh, uh, the vision a little bit better by reducing some of those higher order aberrations, but we can't, or excuse me, not those higher order aberrations, by cutting out the lower order aberrations, but we still have the higher order aberrations to contend with. And the quality of that vision is still not going to be very good. But you can see that even when we're looking at this in this simulation, you can still kind of make out the, uh, the radio stations. You can see that we can infer what's going on there. But that vision is not good. The quality of that vision is very poor. So that's what we're trying to correct when we're using our specialty contact lenses, right? We're trying to put those dots back together by masking that irregular anterior cornea, right? So when we add that, we can improve the point spread function quite a bit and improve the quality of that vision quite a bit, but it's still not perfect. We still have some blurring there, right? So we can look now at the more simple ways in which we can affect the higher order aberrations for an individual. One of those is looking at the peripheral light rays, right? And this is where we get into 
lens eccentricity, asphericity. You'll hear refractive surgeons refer to this as the Q value. Essentially what this is, is correcting or rather changing the front optical surface profile to get the points to all come together at a single point, right? If we use a spherical lens, right? A perfectly spherical lens, what we get is that the points of light are going to spread a little bit. They're not all gonna to come to the exact same point. And that's what gives us, if it's perfectly lined up on the line of sight, spherical aberration. So we get a little extended depth of focus with that uh, as kind of that double-edged sword of working with spherical aberration, but we don't get perfect optical clarity. By creating a change in the periphery of the lens, we're able to better focus those light rays to a single point to reduce the level of aberration that's present. So let's give you an example here. So what I did here was again, we're going back to taking topography so you can see what the shape change is on the front surface of these lenses, right? It is a physical shape change. These lenses have actually the exact same central power, but you can see that the periphery of the lens changes dramatically in its shape. So you can see in the low eccentricity, we have a generally even sort of surface shape Whereas in the high eccentricity or the high asphericity, we have more of a peripheral shape change, right? So let's see how we use this, right? This is a patient with keratoconus and Intex. It's the same patient. We're using lenses that are actually all the exact same power. But what you can see is that we're changing the eccentricity. On the left, we have a low eccentricity in the middle, a mid eccentricity and on the right, a high eccentricity. And what you can see is that the high order aberrations change drastically from lens to lens. Now this is available in one of the trial lens fitting sets uh, that comes with one of the types of scleral lenses out there. We can talk about that a little bit later, but they call this a FSE or a front surface eccentricity uh, ability to control the optics, right? Now, these are not customized to the individual, but rather you're kind of selecting from these and doing a trial and error process going, okay, let's put this on the eye. Is your quality of vision better? Yes, it is. Great. Okay, we're going to go with that eat front surface eccentricity to try and improve the quality of the vision for that individual, right? Now, the downside to this is not, it's that it's not fully customized to the patient's individual higher order aberration profile, right? We can change the general aberrations there in spherical, but just like uh, was said earlier, if we have a lens that's decentered a little bit, that spherical aberration now turns into coma, right? So with this, we're if we have decentration, we're actually affecting the coma of the eye. So when we look at this, we really are saying, okay, these are pre-manufactured surface profiles. And we can put those on the eye and see subjectively, does the patient enjoy this level of vision better or worse than another eccentricity front through surface profile? So when we look at these images, I happen to use a wafer and aberrometer to look at the top of this so I can objectively understand what this individual is telling me. And I can confirm that, yes, this is in fact um, an improvement over what they actually have but this is by no means customized to that individual's wavefront profile. Multifocal optics work on a very similar principle. They're increasing the amount of spherical aberration, but what we're doing here is we're essentially creating that a very small zone, right? We're trying to get a very small area of this so that we can have this concentric bifocal that's gonna work for the individual, right? Now, centration of this is extremely important too. We wanna know that the lens is in the correct spot right over the line of sight for this individual. Now, the tough part about this in scleral lens fitting is we all know that lenses tend to want to decenter inferior temporally. So if we're putting a multifocal on the center of that lens, it's not necessarily going to be right over the pupil, right? So what we can do to understand the centration of the lens is that slit lamp trick that we talked about before but we can also do placido ring topography over the top and look at our tangential map to say, hey, that's where that, uh, that uh, multifocal uh, optic is. 
Now, the tough part for a lot of us is we're using scleral lenses for reducing higher order aberration. If we look at the scope study, the majority of these are used for irregular corneas, over 70% of them. So we're, we're trying to reduce their aberration profiles. But now when we add in the multifocals, we're now reintroducing aberrations into it. So that's why we may experience lower levels of success with these multifocals in these patients. So here's an example of how we can take care of that. We can actually decenter on some of the more advanced designs, decenter the multifocal optics to give an individual more clean spherical aberration. So again, this is the uses of a corneal topographer uh, on the top of the contact lens so that I can see exactly where the center of the optics are related to the line of sight. So you can see we're quite inferiorly temporally displaced on this eye. This is the exact same eye. And all we do is we displace the optics, uh, the multifocal optics right to the line of sight. And this individual experiences a much better quality of vision and more functional uh, use of their, uh, their scleral lens for, uh, for reading. Now, there are a few different ways that we can do this in kind of the low tech way, right? The previous stuff that I showed you with putting, you know, different trial lenses with different eccentricity on the eyes, kind of the low tech way of doing it. This is also the low tech way of doing it. We can look at lenses that are out there with uh, laser marks on the front so we can understand where the decentration is and we can tell them, hey, we need to go, you know, three clicks up and to the left to be able to get into the center of the line of sight. We can use you know, our topography to measure, uh, to measure where that decentration is as well. And we can also use these online calculators to kind of say, okay, based on you know, these parameters of the, uh, the lens and the pupil and the iris and the position of the marks, this is where we need to decenter that lens to get those optics to be in the right spot. So that can increase the success of that. But let's go back to these individuals where you know, they're wearing the contact lens, let's say they have a keratoconus, but the vision is still not perfect for it. They have these residual aberrations, right? Well, this is where the newest form of scleral lens optics are really coming into play. And when I say newest form, this is not really that new anymore. These really became available in clinical practice back in 2020. So it's been several years now that we've been able to have access to these uh, in, uh, in clinical practice. Now, when we look at this, this is a higher order aberration correcting optical profile for a patient with keratoconus. And what you can see is that there, it almost looks like keratoconus. The irregular pattern on the front surface of the lens that's carved into those optics are there to cancel out the aberrations created by the keratoconic cornea. So why don't we have perfect optics when we put a scleral lens on an eye? Well, we can see that in a variety of different you know, papers that are out there, we have residual aberrations. And these can be contributed to by several different factors. One being the decentration of the lens and the eccentricities on that lens profile. But also we can have the internal sources of higher order aberrations from the posterior cornea as a big contributor, but also the crystalline lens and other portions of the ocular media as well. So when we look at this, what are we getting? We're getting, uh, when we wear a, uh, or excuse me, when we have a keratoconic cornea, naturally, because of the curvature of the front surface and the posterior surface of the cornea, there is a little bit of compensation to that cornea in the form of the aberration profile. So we have less severe aberrations because we're getting compensation from the front and the back surface, right? And when we put a contact lens on the front of it, specifically a rigid lens, it masks that anterior cornea, but reveals more of those posterior corneal aberrations. Now, in some of these individuals, you'll find that actually, if you use a soft lens that drapes to that anterior cornea, you can actually get a better outcome for that individual than what you might get with a rigid lens because you're just reducing those aberrations rather than trying to eliminate them. Many of these individuals, when you put a rigid lens on them, it's gonna flip. So what you can see here is this vertical coma that's happening in this individual. This is without the lens. And then when we put the lens on, you can see that that coma has now flipped. Think of that like in refractive surgery, if you flip the axis of a patient, so let's say they're a minus one at, uh, at uh, 180, 
and you overcorrect them on that, and they now are a minus one at 90, they can't get used to the vision, right? It's a sudden optical change and they go, oh, this is super uncomfortable. Same thing when you're using a scleral lens or a rigid lens for these individuals. So the goal here is to reduce those residual HOAs. So the way that we do this is with disruptive interference. Same sort of concept as noise canceling headphones. We have sound wave coming in and we track that in the microphone within the, uh, the uh, headset. And then we reverse that sound wave and play it into the ear. So what happens is the two wavelengths, or excuse me, sound waves in this case, cancel out. Well, with scleral lens and HOA correction, we're doing the exact same thing, but just with light. So what we're doing is we're putting a lens on the eye with uh, a little uh, uh, fiducials on it to understand where the lens is located uh, as far as decentration or rotation. And then we take our wafer and aberrometry over it. We map out our aberrations. We inverse those, manufacture them into the front surface of the lens. And then when we put it on the eye, we're able to reduce the aberrations for that individual. So Marsex work again, uh, this is a tremendous uh, you know, uh, innovation here. So what we can see is this is the total aberrations of the whole ocular system with the contact lens. And you can see that vertical coma. What we do then is we invert the data so that we can create that disruptive interference pattern. And then we manufacture it into the surface of the lens in that correct orientation so that it's right over the line of sight. And then when that lens with that a uh, disruptive interference pattern is on, is worn, it cancels out those aberrations and reduces the total higher order aberration that an individual sees. So these are totally customized to that individual's ocular surface or to that uh, individual's uh, wavefront aberrometry profile. So what we can see is that we get a large improvement in that visual acuity, right? We can really improve the quality of an individual's vision. Now, this has been around for a long time. This is not a new concept. This is first filed in, in 2002 with the Magnanti uh, patents. And when we look at, uh, you know, kind of the investigations on this, the first real publications on this came about in 2013. And what we've seen in the publications and the data so far is somewhere in the order of about a 40 to 65% reduction in aberration and about a one to two line improvement in visual acuity. And in concept, this is very simple to do, but it's extremely difficult to execute in clinical practice without a system. Our early attempts at this, we tried to do this without a system by following the steps outlined in the research, uh, but without integrated lenses and you know, aberrometry in place, what we had to do was piece it all together. We took images, we took measurements off of placido topography, we took aber aberrometry off of multiple devices, we jailbreak to those devices so we get the aberrometry profiles out. We tried to create optical profiles and you can see that they were very different from aberrometer to aberrometer. It was very, very time consuming and it didn't really work. We had one out of seven patients that was successful with this. So we stopped pursuing it in 2019 and lucky for us in early 2020, uh, the uh, a system is available. Uh, so this is a fully integrated system where we can actually take the aberrations and send it directly to the lab Everything is manufactured uh, there. All we have to do is send the, uh, uh, take the aberration measurement in the office and send out the data uh, from the device by a simple click of the button. And basically what we're getting is the ability to create these optical profiles. And what we can do is on the device, we can do comparisons so we can see how good our outcome was. How much of a correction did we get for this individual? Um, now, there are some labs that are still allowing you to do this with a standalone aberrometer where you can submit data to the lab and they'll kind of figure it out on the back end. Uh, my experience with it is that I get much better results with a fully integrated system. Um, so let's talk about some results. So this is one of the case studies that we published on this. This was a cardiothoracic surgeon. This individual is 2030 uncorrected. Uh, but is having difficulty uh, during his training. We fit him with a scleral lens and I'm going, hey, this is gonna be great. You're gonna do really well. Lo and behold, I put the scleral lens on him. He still has a tremendous amount of higher order aberrations coming through and his visual acuity is still 2030. What we then did was we created a higher order aberration correcting scleral lens for him and we reduced his aberrations by about 
65% in both eyes, and it improved his visual acuity by two lines. You can see the uh, before maps of his wavefront profile while wearing the traditional scleral lens, his post maps with the higher order aberration correcting scleral lens. And then you can take a look at the individual polynomials here, and you can see that we've reduced a significant amount of coma and trefoil and spherical aberration for this individual to improve his quality of vision. Now, we've also done some retrospective work. This was our original studies that were published, or excuse me, that were uh, presented uh, as abstracts at uh, GSLS uh, and Academy. What we can see here is that in general, in a 31i retrospective, we saw pretty consistent with the data that's been published before. One and a half lines of visual acuity improvement, about a 55% reduction in higher order aberrations. And when we looked at the best corrected visual acuity, 94% of these individuals showed one line or more uh, improvement in vision. About 6% showed no visual acuity improvement. But what we also saw was that every single one of these patients had a improvement in their higher order aberrations. And virtually all of them said that they preferred the higher order aberration correcting lens. And you can see that there was a variety of individuals who had huge, massive 70 to 80% reductions in uh, aberrations. The other thing that I want to point out is that some individuals had three or four lines of visual acuity improvement. We also looked at the effect of neural adaption, right? We wanted to look at patients and say, hey, if I put a lens on you today, is that the same vision that you're going to get once you've neurally adapted to this lens? So what we did was we dispensed lenses and measured them in office, and then we measured them again four weeks later and compared the differences between those traditional optics and the wavefront guided optics. What we found was at dispense, three of 11 eyes showed no improvement in visual acuity. But at four week follow up, all of those eyes showed an additional line of visual acuity improvement. So when you're using these lenses, don't jump right away when you dispense it to say, oh, you know, they're not really getting a visual acuity improvement. Let these individuals neurally adapt so that their brain can figure out what to do with the uh, improved optics. Another thing that we looked at was the effect of uh, uh, using uh, wavefront guided optics in patients who have had intacts. So we looked at six eyes of four patients, all of them with intacts. And what we found was a little less of an improvement in vision, about one line of improvement, but they still improved about 54% uh, on, uh, on their higher order aberrations. Now, when we looked at a retrospective, this was Dr. Sue's work, she looked at six eyes of four patients who had post-penetrating keratoplasties. And these individuals ended up with about a line of visual acuity improvement, just under one line, but still, again, about a 57% higher order aberration reduction. So again, we're seeing that this is a common trend. These individuals do improve quite a bit. Now we did a large retrospective uh, looking at 110 eyes of uh, our about 250 eyes, um, just that's as far as we got through the data so far. Um, but these were all patients that were just willing to try these higher order aberration correcting optics. The cohort is predominantly keratoconus, but you can see that we have a mix or smattering of other uh, disease states in there. And you can see that on average, they did improve about a line. And when we looked at the aberrations, again, we reduced aberrations by about 50%. Now, when we looked at the retrospective data, the interesting thing was, was that this was anybody who wanted to try it, right? And what we saw was that a large percentage of, the, or yeah, a large percentage of these individuals actually had no change in their visual acuity. Later on, we realized that we weren't measuring them at four weeks on a lot of these cases. We were seeing them at the one week and saying, good, you're done. Your aberration profile is better. You're seeing better. See you later, Right or rather you're, you're having a better quality of vision that you're reporting, you're done. Anyway, what we're looking at though is that a small percentage, about 7% actually lost a line or greater. Most of these eyes happened because of decentration of a lens, rotation of a lens, a lens that essentially was not stable on the eye and that actually will reduce the quality of the vision. So you need really, really stable lenses for these to work out. But what you can also see though, is that about 40, or excuse me, about, uh, 55% gained a line or more of vision. We had an individual who even gained five lines of visual acuity. 
So these can be highly impactful for these individuals. The other thing that we saw was about 95% of them saw an improvement in higher order aberrations, uh, whether that is you know, any level of aberration correction, but we can see that a good majority of them have 30% or greater visual acuity, or excuse me, aberration reduction. Now we did a prospective study that we're looking at right now. We were able to unmask because we got about halfway through it, um, but we had 34 of these individuals that dropped out in this 100 eye study, uh, or excuse me, 30, uh, yeah, 34 uh, individuals that dropped out. They were either lost to follow up, they liked their original lens because they were getting a free lens and they disappeared. Uh, we couldn't get a good enough scleral lens fit for them to continue forward. They voluntarily discontinued because the process was taking too long or they had a health complication that prevented them from moving forward. So when we looked at these 23 eyes that were analyzed, what we found was 1.2 lines of visual acuity improvement and around 50% uh, HOA correction. Now, the next cool thing was we started experimenting with the concept of, well, if we can wipe away your aberrations, why can't we add back in perfect amounts of spherical aberration right into the line of sight, right where we want it to be? And that's what we did here. This was a patient with keratoconus. You can see that their traditional uh, scleral lens on the leftmost images, uh, they had a tremendous amount of point spread function uh, spreading. Um, when we corrected their aberration profiles, you can see how much tighter those points got, their visual acuity improved. Uh, but this individual was 2015 at distance, but 2030 at near. What we then did was add in a perfect amount of spherical aberration. You can see that the point spread function got a little bit worse, but it's still not nearly as bad as even the traditional optics. So with their traditional optics, the patient was 2030 at distance and 2025 at near with the higher order aberration correcting lenses, 2015 at distance and 2030 at near. But with the wavefront guided EDOF lenses, this individual was 2020, or no, excuse me, 2015 at distance and 2020 at near. So an extremely uh, effective uh, improvement for this individual who has an irregular cornea. This is an outcome on an irregular cornea. Then the question comes out, what, what are we gonna do? Can we do this in normal corneas? Yes, we can. This is a case where we use this in an individual who was intolerant to corneal gas perms, but wanted to keep that you know, uh, rigid lens quality of vision. And what we can see is that this is the, the difference between their base lens on the left and their higher order aberration correcting lens on the right. And you can see that we reduced their aberrations in the lens by about 50%, even though this individual didn't get another line of vision, they still were doing quite well. They appreciated the improvement in that visual acuity, but you can see that there's still 2040 at near and they're unhappy with that. So what we did was we added the EDOF to it. And this EDOF, you can see that we increased the amount of aberrations quite a bit, but this individual maintained 2020 distance vision and got 2020 near vision with this uh, EDOF profile that we got on there. And you can see on those corneal topographies, the over topographies, that these optics are perfectly placed over the line of sight, right within the pupil. And you can see that they're slightly irregular looking and that's compensating for that higher order aberration that's there as well. So it's not that we're just putting a you know, fully symmetric, uh, uh, you know, multifocal on there, we're really correcting this perfectly to that individual's needs. Now, what are the challenges that come up with HOA optics? Well, it's a dynamic visual system, right? We know that the, you know, the pupil is going to change size, the lens is going to change shape, we know that the tear film is going to change from blink to blink. Well, that's why these optics are not going to be perfect. That's why we're not knocking out 100% of the higher order aberrations, right? The other thing here is, does everybody do well? Well, media opacities, if we have scatter rather than defocus, it can limit the level of improvements. And scatter is going to come from things like corneal scars or, uh, or cataracts or even vitreous opacities. The other portion of this is going to be if we have lenses that are decentered severely. Right here, you can see that the optic of the, uh, the scleral lens is bisecting the pupil. 
And that pupil bisection is what's going to cause even more scattering of that light. And you can see in that top, top portion of the spot diagram, this uh, uh, odd arcing and loss of uh, defined points. And what we end up with is kind of a portion where we go, well, we can't really figure out what to do with the aberration right there because it's such a hard transition. So we would have limited improvements for this individual, right? The other thing too, is that there are, you know, some answers. Marsex group has done tremendous work in this area, looking at lens misalignment. So how much of a, a lens misalignment can a person tolerate? Well, it turns out that a very small amount of misalignment can lead to a significant reduction in vision for an individual. What about wear and tear over time? These are sub-micron changes that we're etching into the front surface of these lenses during the manufacturing process. Do those hold up over time? And what they found was with simulated cleaning to simulate a one year of wear of uh, just you know cleaning the lens, uh, the changes to the front surface or to the optical profile that's uh, ground into the lens surface is not clinically significant or would not be clinically significant. What's the contribution to coatings on these lenses? Well, they don't seem to have a clinically significant effect either. However, if you have an individual who has tear breakup on the front surface of the lens, um, they will have a significant effect. The coatings themselves, just adding hydropeg to it, is not going to con uh, you know, clinically significantly change the wavefront, right? That nano layer of, uh, of peg on the front surface is not going to change that optical profile, but having lenses break down on the front surface of the lens will. So having hydropeg may be beneficial for these individuals. What about stability of the lens? Does stability of the lens matter? Yes, absolutely. Because if we have slight misalignment, that's gonna reduce the level of vision. So having extremely stable lenses is extremely important for these individuals, right? So to try and, you know, talk about having a lens where, you know, in, in my case, when we were doing this early on, there were a lot of lenses that maybe had a slight bit of movement to them. And I would have said without these level of optics, hey, this is fine. This is a great final lens. They're doing great. This is wonderful. Let's go straight to HOA optics. That's a no-no. That lens is not going to be stable enough to give them consistent, good vision. So we really need to up our game as far as making sure that the lens is stable and aligned and lined up perfectly. The other question too is when do we dilate patients, right? Our data on this, none of those patients were dilated. They were all dark adapted in a, in a room without lights, no windows, nothing. All we were doing were taking the aberrations in that environment. So we have a, you know, the maximum uh, natural pupil size that we're going to get. However, there are effects that can come in such as, you know, instrument uh, accommodation, um, you know, and we want to know those various different effects. So jury's still out. Do we dilate patients? Do we not dilate patients? Uh, the other published data that's out there is all with patients being dilated uh, and being cycloplegied. Um, the question is, is what topical works best? Do we want a little bit of uh, accommodation to be able to happen because there's a natural amount of lens accommodation that's going to happen in any individual? All of these questions need to be answered. The other question is the time to settling, right? If I put a lens on in the office with the alignment dots on it, is that enough time? It's 30 minutes enough time, 10 minutes enough time for an individual to have that lens stabilize on the eye so that I know that I have the maximum settling of the lens. Currently, the way that I do it is I dispense their alignment lens to them and have them come back a week later so that I can get the most settled lens out of the, out of the uh, or the most settled lens possible for the individual. This is an example of an unstable lens. So this was the HOA when he came in and you can see that his profile there is not great, right? Uh, because it's out of place. Now, when, it's, uh, when we've reinserted it, it's gone back into its normal position, but you can see the differences in those point spread functions, right? The second one is much more clear than the first one. So these are the changes that happen when we have little bits of rotation, right? So this is, this is why this patient was complaining that his vision was not very good. 
Now, the other thing that was very interesting, so Steve Vincent did this at GSLS. So he took uh, our, our published paper and our data, and what he was able to do was backwards reconstruct the optics of that individual so that he could understand what is that optical profile like. What he then did was say, could we use a customized amount of just eccentricity to try to improve the optics for this individual, right? And what he did was he took a, the uh, simulation of the traditional optics here, and then my simulation of what we got with our uh, higher order aberration, and then he compared it to just a front surface uh, eccentricity. And what you can see is, or an optimized front surface eccentricity. What you can see is it's not nearly as good as the full correction for that individual. So all of the aberrations, but a customized front surface that's kind of average for that individual can do pretty darn well. So what we may see is that for individuals with lenses that aren't able to be totally stable on the eye, that maybe having a more optimized eccentricity is a good way to go for those individuals versus going fully into full higher order aberration correction. And we may wanna reserve the full higher order aberration correction to those who have very, very perfectly stable lenses. So the other thing that we wanna look at is the media clarity, and we're just gonna burn through this. If you use a shine flow topographer, you can see the spikes in the, uh, uh, the GSUs or the clarity measurements. In this case, we have the cornea. Uh, in this case, we have a, uh, uh, you know, we're looking at the, uh, uh, the lens. So the yellow box is looking at the lens clarity. So we can tell the difference from where that media is coming from. We can use corneal densitometry to, you know, quantify this. Essentially, this is measured on a level of GSUs. So what's scatter? When we talk about scatter, right, what, what are we talking about? Well, what we're looking at is the clarity or the outline of that single spot there, right? So you can see the spot on the left has a much more perfect outline versus the spot on the right, which is much more diffuse and kind of scattered, right? And those scatters can come from cataract, uh, corneal scars, uh, vitreous opacities, those sorts of things. So this is the sort of thing that you would see with a dense corneal scar. This patient has keratoconus, and you can see on the densitometry, they're very dense corneal scarring, and you get this kind of scatter effect on those points. Now, scleral lenses we know with corneal, uh, with, uh, corneal clarity uh, can improve under a scleral lens uh, over time. Scars can lighten, opacities can lighten, uh, lipid can resolve because we've gotten rid of the, uh, the inflammatory cascade. All those things can help. We've shown this with uh, you know, the use of scleral lens over time for an individual um, and the clarity that can be restored in their cornea. Um, but these GSUs are going to affect the uh, clarity of the individual's vision. And we can also look at midday fogging as a contributor to scatter as well. Another thing that we want to look at is things that are within the pupil. So intracorneal ring segments that are located within the pupil, like this individual here, you can see with the white light image, with the bright light, their pupil constricts. But when they're dark adapted, you can see that those uh, intracorneal ring segments are right within the measurement area. And if we look at our spot diagram, you can see where those uh, ring segments are and where they're distorting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the spots there. So that will contribute to a loss uh, or, or an inability to create a really good HOA profile. And that individual may do better off with a optimized eccentricity.